Okay, hey everyone, welcome again to the Mount Sinai and Open Back Science Computational Omics Seminar. And uh, today we're very honored to have Dr. Jonas Schuter, which I just learned the name, it's actually fairly easy to pronounce, from NYU. And Jonas started um, last year, right before the pandemic, as assistant professor in the Institute for Computational Medicine and Department of Microbiology at NYU Langone Health. And he has a background both in microbiotechnology and mathematical biology when he joined the lab of Kevin Foster at Oxford. And doing his PhD he has really built an evolutionary model of the gut microbiome studying various types of microbiome populations before that, he has really solid uh, mathematical background studying GAN theory in Japan, and also to have investigate evolutionary conflicts in the microbiome. And today, I think we'll hear partially about his work in uh, Xavier's group at MSKCC as research scholar, where he studied how the gut microbiome affects the gut immune system of the cancer, or the immune system overall of the cancer patients. and. Uh, Really lucky to have him here and look forward to hearing from him. So Jonas, your turn to take it away. Thank you so much for that nice introduction and inviting me. And thanks, thank you guys for joining. Um, I'm gonna go start the presentation. So um, yeah, my lab is interested in studying the gut microbiome. And eventually we want to turn the microbiome into a therapeutic target of the future. Um, most of you, by now we'll have heard that there exist microbiomes across the human body. So this is just a brief intro. Um, as you might be aware, the skin and the mouth, the urogenital tract all harbor their own populations of bacteria, but by far the most dense and diverse community lives in the gastrointestinal tract. In the GI tract, there's a thick mucus layer that separates the microbes from the host tissue. And the microbes in the GI tract, they ferment carb complex carbohydrates. They perform a lot of metabolic functions. They yield short chain fatty acids um, that all tend to benefit the host. But this seeming beneficial relationship between a microbial community of diverse microorganisms and the host organism is an evolutionary puzzle. And this puzzle comes already from what uh, Darwin wrote, because Darwin has said that if it could be proved that any part of the structure of any one species had been formed for the exclusive good of another species, it would annihilate my theory for such could not have been produced through natural selection. But when you read the gut microbiome literature or the microbiome literature in general, it is generally considered beneficial. And there's an interesting question here, how we can explain this seeming cooperation between microbes and hosts. And as Quan has introduced, that's been sort of subject of my a PhD research in Oxford and then later on in Japan. Um, but I want to summarize the lessons that we've learned from evolutionary theory. And a crucial aspect I think that is sometimes underappreciated in the microbiome world is that while the gut microbiome as a whole performs many metabolic functions, just like a human organ, unlike an organ, the competition between the constituent parts, the species of the microbiome, can disrupt the evolution of host beneficial symbionts. And uh, my research, referenced in the bottom right, has, for example, suggested that host control is a crucial mechanism that can evolve to enforce helpfulness of symbionts. But in a more tangible phrase, the picture of an ecosystem on a leash emerges where the host evolved abilities to restrain and constrict ecosystems dynamics of a complex community. And these are not just idle considerations from a theoretical perspective. These insights from a very fundamental game theoretical and computational modeling approach will, I think, be crucial if we want to engineer the microbiome in the future. And it is important to realize for us that microbes first and foremost evolved to compete well with one another in this fierce, fiercely competitive ecosystem. And that therefore, all the effects that we might measure onto the hosts are likely byproducts of the evolution of bacteria towards competing well with one another. And this is crucial if we want to treat the microbiome as a therapeutic target in the future. But even if we, if we talk about the microbiome as a therapeutic target, what we first must do is establish a form of causality where we can say that a change in the microbiome causally affects the health of the host. And that can be done using controlled experiments, which are of course very difficult to do in humans. 
And therefore, most of our insights into microbiome host relationships still come from mouse, mouse models. In, in mice, we can, for example, create notobiotic mice, which is where a mouse is essentially void of all bacteria and then colonized with specific strains of bacteria to see how that might change the host. On the other side, we can also perturb the host severely by creating knockout mice and see how a genetic change on the host side might affect that relationship. In either way, a strong perturbation on the host or the microbiome side is feasible using mouse models. However, there has been a paper out last year criticizing the utility of microbiome studies and mouse models for microbiome studies because of the strong differences in ecology that exist between a mouse and a human host and that a lot of there's a there's a strong need for more human data and validation in humans for the relationships identified in in highly artificial mouse studies. And because it is very difficult to do experiments in humans, I want to introduce um, hematopoietic stem cell therapy and patients undergoing this therapy as a model to study causal relationships between the microbiome and the host. Um, HSCT, hematopoietic stem cell transplantation, is a potentially curative treatment for a range of blood cancers, and it includes the strongest deliberate perturbation of the human immune system that is performed. Um, here you see a cartoon where I'm sort of indicating the counts of leukocytes over time during this therapy. During the initial phase of, that transplant, uh, of the transplant therapy, patients are treated with radiation and chemotherapy, which depletes their circulating leukocytes, the white blood, white blood cell counts. Then once that has been done, um, healthy stem cells from a donor are transplanted. Patients undergo a prolonged period of what is called leukopenia or neutropenia, where there are essentially no white blood cells in circulation. And then once the stem cells engraft in the bone marrow, they start, produ they start producing new white blood cells. Um, here you can see actual data from over 2,000 patients from um, the clinical records at Memorial Sloan Kettering, and you see that this trajectory is re um, reflected in the neutrophil counts over time, the lymphocyte counts, and the monocyte counts. But at the same time, there's also a severe perturbation of the gut microbiome during this therapy. Here you see a single patient's uh, microbial composition over time. Each bar represents the abundances of different types of bacteria in each of the phases. And you can see we have high temporal resolution samples for this patient and the microbiome undergoes many different changes. It, the patient enters the, uh, the hospital with a diverse microbiome, um, undergoes severe perturbation in the middle and then eventually has a complete domination by enterococcus here in green. So the therapy of HSCT includes a major perturbation of the host, a major perturbation of the microbiome, and we have massive amounts of clinical data from electronic health records and in these records, many of the potential confounders of these interesting simultaneous dynamics are resolved. So with this data, and the, one of the most interesting questions about the microbiome is, of course, does the microbiota influence the human immune system? With this data, we can curb our enthusiasm to a degree and ask instead, does the microbiota influence the immune reconstitution dynamics in these cancer patients? And today I'll present to you some data that narrows down and tries to indicate a causal relationship using two different data sets, one from a deliberate intervention in our patients and one from massive amounts of longitudinal data. And this is uh, our recent paper, I think, which is the title of today's talk, The Gut Microbiota is Associated with Immune Cell Dynamics in Humans. So first, I, I, I briefly summarize a clinical trial that we've conducted in our patients. Um, because patients undergo such severe perturbation in the microbiome, and our clinical collaborators have found that this perturbation is associated with better or worse survival of patients, we have enrolled 24 patients in a randomized controlled trial of autologous fecal microbiota transplantation. In, this, is, this is a therapy where we essentially took a stool sample from a patient when they entered the hospital, we froze that sample, and after the patients had successfully engrafted and the donated stem, cell, stem cells had begun producing white blood cells again, we then uh, conducted an enema on the treatment arm of this, of this cohort and replaced the local microbiome that was in the patient at that time with that that we froze when they came into the clinic. So it is essentially an attempt to restore the patient's own microbiome after the severe perturbation induced by the therapy. And on the right-hand side, I show you the results of this trial. So 
very briefly, it's not important to pay too much attention to the details here, but on the left side of the left column, we see the control arm and on the right side, we see the treatment arm. And in red is indicated those species that we were, that were lost relative to the original sample taken from when they entered the hospital. And in blue is those that were found at the end of the, of the trial. And you can see that treatment with FMT successfully restored many of the important bacteria in the gut microbiome. But of course, for my question, it is important now to ask, did this autologous fecal microbiota transplantation affect the immune reconstitution in these patients? And that is a bit of a difficult thing to answer because what I'm showing you in this graph is the white blood cell trajectories for each of the enrolled patients. So in blue, you see the neutrophil trajectories, the neutrophil counts over time, and in green, the lymphocyte counts, and in monocytes, the, the uh, sorry, in orange, the monocyte counts. And the dashed bar indicates the day of randomization at which the FMT would have been conducted in a control arm that were randomized out and did not receive an enema, or here in red, when the FMT actually happened in the treatment arm. And you can see that the trajectories are highly variable, but also the time point of the therapy of the um, auto FMT is very variable. And one easy way of bringing some order into this mess is to reset these trajectories all so that the day zero is now the day at which the FMT was conducted. So we're basically shifting all these trajectories and then look at the average white blood cell counts in each of these patients over time. And you can already see that this looks as though the FMT treated arm had on average a higher white blood cell count than the control arm. And indeed, when we did a, um, a time series analysis model of this, uh, we could, with statistical significant, uh, with the highest statistical significance, associate the treatment with an increase in white blood cell counts over time. So what this shows is then that FMT restored the gut microbiome composition of the patients that were treated and led to an increase in white blood cell counts. And this is perhaps the gold standard of a causal association because all things equal, these patients were the same and the only difference between the two groups was that we had induced a deliberate change in the microbiome. Nevertheless, even though this is a very causal setup, it is still a small number statistics trial with only 14 patients treated and 10 patients um, in the control group. So I'm now gonna start talking about the other way of in, um, analyzing causal relationships, which is using longitudinal data. So longitudinal data can, because of the clear before and after relationship, analyze what is called mathematical causality. And for that, we need a lot of data with high temporal resolution, which I can show you here, ha we have in our patients. So I can show you here the white blood cell counts of two different patients that are highly variable in their recovery trajectories. And alongside of this, we've recorded the microbiome compositions over time that also differ between these two patients and various clinical confounders in the form of immunomodulatory medications. So the, the underlying theory, the underlying idea behind it, I like to describe that if we knew everything about a person today, how their blood looks like tomorrow should not be entirely random. We should be able to analyze this. And the way we went about this is, um, I like to explain this model that we've developed with an analogy. Imagine that you're an alien that visits the planet Earth and has no idea about our physical reality, but this alien is allowed to observe football matches, many, many football matches over time and can record the position, velocity of the football and also the various kicks that the players exert onto the ball. In then measuring whenever a kick happened and correcting for the effect of kicks, the, the alien would be able to nevertheless see that whenever a ball was kicked, it tends to fall down again onto Earth and could thereby infer the existence of a gravitational force that was never directly measured. And in a similar sense, we're trying to do this using all the data given to us from clinical records and the stool compositions in these patients. So uh, a, a quick, easy cartoon to describe this model is then we can measure the neutrophil counts on a given day. And then sometimes the neutrophils will increase on the next day and sometimes they might decrease. But if we then, for example, associate the various kicks that we've also recorded with these changes in neutrophil counts, we could assert that, for example, whenever GCSF, a medication commonly given to increase neutrophils, was administered on the day uh, today, we would observe an increase in neutrophils on the next day. And then we scale this model up 
in a, in, a, in a massive sense. And we have a two-stage two analysis that we've developed. So we first analyze all the patients of whom we had no information on the microbiome to learn clinical features. So as you can imagine, medical data and clinical data is often confounded by so many different things that happen during treatment. And together with our clinical collaborators, we, we gave it a first pass based on clinical knowledge and then learned um, features that were associated with changes from patients without microbiome information to then conduct a more detailed analysis on the patients for whom we did have the microbiome information and contextualize all of these effects at once in a dynamic systems model. So it's a differential equation model that describes the rates of changes in white blood cell counts over time with all the cl clinical and the microbiome features as um, coefficients. We linearize the system and then conduct a Bayesian inference and get um, as a proof of principle, first of all, many clinical effects from medications in, this, in the way that they were expected. So for example, as I mentioned earlier, GCSF is a drug developed to change neutrophil counts, and we find that it is the most strongly associated factor in a positive change of neutrophils from one day to another. And in that same model, we were then also able to identify many different bacterial genera that also had an effect onto the white blood cell dynamics. Um, the important question is, when we have these multivariate dynamic systems models, what is the meaning of a coefficient like that? It is very hard sometimes to satisfactorily say what the effect size really means. And to analyze that, we have then taken our Bayesian model, which is a generative model, so that means we can generate new observations out of it. And we've then used the inferred parameters, sampling the microbiome either from the patients that were highest or lowest in the abundance of the most crucial genera and simulated these time series forward and find that indeed the bacterial abundances either from this group or that group dramatically change the predicted recovery trajectories of the immune reconstitution. So then what we've shown here is does the microbiota influence immune reconstitution? And the answer is a yes. And I've shown you that causality comes from the interventional trial, but also perhaps on a less you know, ideal scale, also from longitudinal data, because a before and after relationship already rules out many confounders, and we've tried our very best to also rule out clinical confounders. So the residual information that we can learn from the microbiome hopefully reflects some form of causality because of the temporal nature and the, the setup of the mathematical model. Um, and reassuringly, what we also found is that among those species that the randomized controlled trial was best at reconstituting were those species we found most positively associated with the dynamics of white blood cell counts in our Bayesian model. Um, so the question is, are these then microbial targets for future therapies? Um, one caveat is that our model cannot distinguish the type of sources and sinks that these re coefficients actually represent. So for example, we identified a positive effect of staphylococcus onto lymphocyte counts, which could indeed not be an effect of the bacteria themselves, but rather a change in migration patterns. Lymphocytes tend to circulate in the blood and migrate into tissues. And Staphylococcus is generally an indicator of a very depleted gut microbiome, such that perhaps some T cells might not actually migrate into the epithelium and therefore stay in circulation more, yielding a positive association. On the other hand, Ruminococcus nervus seems to suppress lymphocytes and is a bacterium often associated with inflammatory disease and could indeed pull out T cells from the circulation into the gut epithelium. Also, even if a relationship is causal, we don't know the mechanism from this analysis, of course. We have many hypotheses, for example, nutritional support from the microbiome onto the host hematopoietic system has been proposed in mice, mouse models and short chain fatty acids, the common byproduct of microbial metabolisms uh, can increase T regulatory cells. But even without knowing the perfect mechanism here, I would say that these genera that we've identified are still the most promising targets if we want to steer complex immunology in humans. And now that we've reached the end, I want to thank all my clinical and scientific collaborators. And I want to thank you for listening to me and I'm open to questions now. And also I'd like to advertise that we are having postdoc positions available in my lab, both in the wet lab and the dry lab to try and turn the microbiome into a therapeutic target. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jonas. And uh, everyone feel free to, I think we have now a pretty tight knit crowd. So feel free to ask questions if you'd like to just ask openly. Um, so I think I'd like to start. Thanks, thanks Jonas, for such a clear 
presentation on a large undertaking and complex study. So I, I think first I'd like to ask that, I guess in your model, you're kind of evaluating the microbes one by one. Are you, are you, or are you considering their collective effects or synergistic effects in any ways? No, it's, it's not one by one at all. It's one gigantic model essentially. Ah, that is this equation in, in, in short form, which is a dynamic systems equation. So it's a differential equation describing the rate of change of white blood cells over time as a function of the actual current counts of white blood cells. So it's some, some sort of autoregressive effect, if you will. In ecology, we would call it a capacity effect. So once, for example, the neutrophils are already at a very high number, it is unlikely they will incre increase much more. So it's a logistic growth effect, if you will. As the numbers reach a very high number, the rate of change will go to zero. Um, and in addition to this autoregressive effect, we include the medications that were administered to patients in that interval that we're observing, and the bacteria found in the gut, and various other clinical confounders. So it's one big model, and these are this is one big multiple variate model. Assuming there are uh, like adding effects. Uh, yes, I mean, it is an additive, it's a, it's a first order differential equation, and it is additive. So each species adds to the growth rate individually, and we're using the log relative abundances as a proxy. Um, that is not ideal, because relative abundances in terms of percentages are, of course, correlated to one another. So for example, if one bacterium goes up, all the others must go down as a consequence. Um, in percentage space. We have on a smaller subset of the data also got quantitative data where we tried to say how many actual bacteria were found in a sample. And we validated the results that the main results still hold. Um, you know, with less data in this kind of complex high dimensional model, it becomes less easy to, to infer the effects, but the major effects that we've observed still hold. Okay, as we wait for the question, um, mm -hmm. I guess I get to mon monopolize and continue on. Then um, I guess also the data you talk about on the FMT sounds very mm -hmm. interesting. So do they overlap mm -hmm. well with the signal here? I guess the sample size yes. here is much smaller. Yes, so, so um, I said it and I probably didn't emphasize it enough. So after we learned these effects, you know, we, we are, we are I'm, I'm always suspicious with the microbiome because I think you can find too many things in, in large high dimensional microbiome data sets. So how do you validate this effect? First of all, we split our patients into three different cohorts all receiving different types of bone marrow transplantations or stem cell transplantations. And we found that these results tended to be um, repeatedly observed across the different cohorts. And then we went back to the FMT trial and checked since that was a clear causal relationship have we reconstituted these genera well? And these three genera most positively associated with neutrophil counts were also the genera that we were most successful at um, reconstituting in the FMT patient cohort. So it's a orthogonal piece of evidence that, that indeed these bacteria might help the host by some unknown molecular mechanism to rebuild the immune system faster and better. Mm -hmm. And of course, now we're interested in finding out what the mechanism is and, and how that all works in, on a molecular basis. And do you know why you're, you seem to see the strongest signals in neutrophils compared to the lymphocytes and monocytes? Mm, I wouldn't necessarily say I see the strongest signal. You mean that there's more species there? That, that had a, yeah, um, I, don't know. I, think, I think it's probably due to that lymphocytes are much more <laughs> dynamically changing. They are very, very migratory. They circulate around. And there are many more factors, I think, perhaps involved with the circulatory counts of lymphocytes than there are for neutrophils. That's a bit of a speculation. But I think that you know, lymphocytes, they, they of course can be formed de novo, but then they migrate a lot. And, and, and so do other white blood cells. But it's, I think that is a reflection of the, you know, that lymphocytes are just generally harder to predict if, if that is satisfactory. You know, I, I think that's probably the answer. Mm. Okay, does any audience have any questions? If you like, you can also type in the chat and we can ask through the chat. Um, maybe I can ask, uh, uh, I'm Tommy, I'm one of the Hemonc fellows at Mount Sinai. Um, just wondering um, if there are any plans to, I guess, maybe phenotype the immune system uh, more besides just like the white cell counts, perhaps, um, you know, lymphocyte subsets and such like. 
Absolutely. I mean, this whole project was started because we have historic complete blood counts for thousands and thousands of patients every day during their hospitalization. So that, that is the, an amount of data that would be extremely hard to reproduce using deep phenotyping of the immune cells. Now that we have this as a first step, of course, we're very interested in using deeper phenotypic characterizations of the blood cells to validate and maybe further refine these associations. But as you can imagine, if you wanted to create 10,000 deeply immunophenotyped blood samples, that would get also quite costly. And what I also hope this, this study shows is that there's actually hidden treasures in the clinical records of very routine measurements that we conduct on patients that we can use to really get new and novel biological insights if we contextualize the body as one big dynamic system as you know, the, the, the term systems biology comes to mind to try really to put all the pieces together and, and observe how they interact with one another as a complementary approach to many mechanistic studies of, of immune system or microbiome relationships. Very cool, thank you. Um, I guess with this uh, large data, you can do more follow-up analysis, but I was wondering, uh, among these drugs administered, are there uh, like cancer immunotherapy drugs? Mm -hmm. um, there are no, like, I mean, there are immunomodulatory medications. There are no, like, there's no CAR T cells or anything in this, for example. Um, we don't have, we also didn't uh, include, I think, we don't have any patients that got any PD-1 checkpoint therapy because it's all bone marrow transplantation patients. Um, but of course, you're right, it would be very interesting to study the effect of the microbiome onto cancer immunotherapy with a similar approach, for sure. Thanks. So there's, there's immunosuppressants and immunosupportive drugs that are given, if you want to call that cancer immunotherapy, then, then yes. But um, the, the, you know, the, the most exciting ones of recent times, I think it would be very cool to conduct a high temporal resolution study on that. And yes. Right. There are probably, um, I guess, there have been cohorts of immunotherapy patients where people associate microbiome changes, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but they haven't applied the similar methodologies as you have, but they also don't have the same dimension of data you have. It, that, that's right. And it's, um, it's, th those are purely associative studies, right? So, so it's very interesting, of course, to observe that uh, patients with a Immuno with a different microbiome. So patients, in fact, enriched, and I skipped over this a little bit, but the same species that we sort of discussed here and in the context of FMT, those were also the same ones that are found at least in some of the PD-1 checkpoint ther um, therapy papers to be enriched in patients that responded better to the cancer immunotherapy. So, it's a, so, so I think you know, this, this is all painting this one picture that a more complete microbiome, a more diverse microbiome, a microbiome that is full of these obligate anaerobic species like Fecalibacterium and Ruminococcus tends to be supportive to the immune system and perhaps help during cancer immunotherapy. Those studies that came out, um, I think 2018 were, was the three of them, um, mm -hmm. that, uh, that, that they were purely associative and clearly they are very important. And it's very exciting to see that association that a patient with more of these bacteria responds better. And then we went to try and work towards causality more directly in, in using these longitudinal measurements and mathematical models, as well as the um, randomized control trial. Yeah, yeah, I think that's uh, definitely a very exciting approach. And um, especially like what you said, there's a lot of treasures in these longitudinal, mm -hmm. but routine clinical data that we have really underlooked in a lot of multi-omic studies. And I think we have a lot to learn from that. Um, so I think given the interest of time, I think we like to thank Jonas for such a great and clear talk that allows us to much better understand his really complex studies. And uh, thanks everyone for attending and asking the questions of recordings. Uh, if Jonas agree, we'll be available uh, for free for, for everyone on YouTube later. And uh, Thank you everyone for attending and thank you, Jonas. Thank you.